Good morning, everyone. Boker Tov. Chanukah Sameach. Shavua Tov. Can you see me and hear me? Awesome. Okay. Get started in just one moment. I don't know with what to begin. Is it with his Torah? There are those here who know more in Torah than I do. If it's in Uh Avur... If it's an avoda, more than he served his creator, Begoloi, in the way that was known, he served his creator in secret. And if it is regarding the Messiris Nefesh for Jews, we cannot sufficiently tell even a tiny drop of it. It is near certain that even in this hall right now are found those that Rabbeinu Zechot Tzadok Levracha gave his, his life for them. From the days of the British mandate until the days of the murderous Germans and others, our Rabbi Rabbeinu, he saved from them from their hands and brought them to Eretz Israel. More than them, yes, Aralehem, Tinokos, Jewish children, the Israel, that had it not been for him, they would have been lost in the nations of the world, Chas Vishalom. And not just that he took them out from among the Goyim, but he brought them up to Eretz Israel and gave them educators, Morim and Mechanchim. And they had the opportunity to learn Torah. And there were those who even became rabbis. More than them are the scores and scores, groups and groups of children that were hidden in mosques, or actually minzarim, in, in, um, in um, convents. And Stam Goyim and Rabbeinu Zatzal saved them from their hands and brought them to Israel. And Vahabavdu ben Achayim ben Achayim, the Rebetzin, she should live and be well, put her eyes on them and her heart and raised them to Torah Chup and Amas and Tovim. Yesh Gedolim Sheboim B'Koach HaTorah. There are those giants who come with the force of Torah. 
V'yesh gedolim shaboim b'koach ma'aseim. And there are gedolim who come with the strength of their maisim, of their actions. Rabbeinu Zatzal, zev zeh hoya biyado. This and this he had in his hand. Who said these words? And about whom did he say these words? These words were spoken by one of the greatest Jewish authors, writers, and spokespeople of modern history. His name was Shmuel Yosef Agnon. That's right. Shai Agnon said these words in the summer of 1959 in Av of Tuf Yutes. And who did he say them about? About whom are we speaking this morning? None other than the Gon Rav Harav Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Herzog, Rabbi Dr. Isaac Herzog, the chief rabbi of Israel who had just passed away 30 days earlier. So Shai Agnon was maspid, he eulogized Rav Herzog with these words. And that's what we're going to focus on today as we frame Rav Herzog's letter back to, back to Ben-Gurion and to understand for ourselves of there are those who come B'Koach HaTorah and there are those who have come B'Koach Maaseim and Rav Herzog had both. And perhaps the theme that we can draw for ourselves is to understand that it's not just that there is a Torah and it's not just that there is a world of Misa, it's that Torah is meant to be lived lemaisa, And that we need to aspire, like Rav Herzog modeled for us, to learn and live Torah lemaisa, Torah lemaisa. Rav Herzog was recognized, the quotes, there is an amazing volume that I'm going to show you on the screen here. It's called Masua Liyitzchak. The word Masua comes from that mission in Rosh Hashanah, Masi and Masuos, lights, torches, the flame of Yitzchak. So this volume was published a few years ago and was gifted to me and is living proof again that you never know when a safer will come in handy. I'm just saying, if people say you have too many svarim, it's not Shaykh because once in a while, a safer like this is literally the greatest safer that ever happened to giving a shear and thinking about and researching Rav Herzog, because this volume is a Sefer Zikar to Rav Yitzchak Isaac Alevi Herzog in commemoration of his 50th yard site. It is an absolutely sensational, incredible volume. It would take us an entire year to go through many of the items in this. It includes speeches, recollections, biography, everything, amazing pictures, amazing pictures. This is a picture. Here's one, there's Rav Herzog. Rav Herzog here again. There's tons, there's some, also some really old ones from when he was younger. This is his picture in Paris on the way to Israel. Can you see? Can you see the picture? And it's traditionally, this is all the, not all, but most of the pictures you see Rav Herzog look like this with his top hat, right? He was British. <clears throat> Rav Herzog was, so in this volume, which has so many incredible and sensational things, they have a collection of quotes of things that people said about him from <clears throat> everyone from Rav Kook to the Chazunish to the most unbelievable one that I saw here was from the Rugged Shover. The Rugged Shover Gon, as some of you know, he was uh, Rav Yosef Rosen from Tvinsk. He was an unbelievably sharp and critical man. Uh, people used to come in to ask him questions. He would throw them out. He would scream at them. He was extremely harsh, unbelievably harsh. He said about Rav Herzog, quote, you ready? He said about Rav Herzog, that it's a simon that the Torah will not be forgotten from the Jewish people because as in Eastern Europe, the light of Torah is dimming, Interesting. I think he wrote this at the beginning of the 20th century. 
Zorach Kochov Mazir Baanglia. In England, a bright light is shining. The Zel Hagon Moreno of Rabbeinu Rav Yitzchak Isaac Alevi Herzog Zatzal. Shlita at that time. Imagine Rav, the Rugged Shover, Rav Yosef Rosen would say this about another person. The Rugged Shover knew, I should show you some of this farm here. He knew Kala Torakula backwards, forwards. He wasn't Stam a genius. He was a super genius. If you went to talk to him in learning and you yourself weren't a genius, you would get tossed out of the room. He was a wild genius. And he said about Rav Herzog that this is the future of Torah Judaism. Unbelievable. But it's not just Torah. It's Torah Lemaissa. So let's talk a little bit about who Rav Herzog was. Just a biographical sketch. Brief, brief. There is a book by Shul Magid, which is a full biography of Rav Herzog. That was, it's published in Hebrew, and then it was published again by Geffen. And it's summarized by uh, Shul Meiselish in this, in this volume, but there's a, an entire separate work. I think it's called The Rabbit During Turbulent Times. Because Rav Herzog, he was born in 1888. He dies in 1959. You can imagine what period of life he's living through, right? You're talking about early foundations of the state, Holocaust, etc. cetera. Rav Herzog, he was born in Lomja in 1888 to his father, Rav Yoel Leib and his mother, Liba Miriam Herzog. His father was a Rav, but he wasn't just a tremendous Talmud Chacham, which he was. He was also notably open to the world, and he was a very active Zionist, religious Zionist. He did not stay long in Lamja, and he moved at the age of nine. Rav, Yitz, Rav uh, Little Yitzchak Herzog was nine years old when they moved for Rav Yoel Herzog to become the rabbi of Leeds. Leeds in England. At this time, at a young age, Rav Herzog was known as an Eloi, as a genius. And in those days, you didn't just throw that term around, Stam Kacha. By the time he was nine years old, he had mastered, not Bikias, not Tafiomi, mastered two, two entire Sdarm of Shas. And from nine until 16, he did not, which is not unlike some of the great just rabbinic luminaries and giants, he did not attend the yeshiva. He was personally tutored by his father, learning mostly by himself. And he didn't even learn English at the beginning. But then as a teenager, he enrolled in university and also started corresponding in letters, some of them anonymously with some of the great gaonim of Eastern Europe. And some of them didn't really even know who this was, that this was a teenage kid who was writing them letters in Torah until it was found out. And a whole long story, he re- ultimately got smicha from Rabbi Meir Simcha the Or Samech of Dvinsk, from Rabbi Reb- Yaakov David Volovsky, the Ridvaz, who the Ridvaz, by the way, just a Chicago shout out, he had a very brief period of time where he was a Rav here in Chicago. He hated it. He cursed the United States before he went on Aliyah to Israel. So I don't know if anybody on this on this call, if anybody had family or friends who knew the Ridvaz, if you did, don't admit it. He didn't like it here. But anyway, the Ridvaz called him the Rebbe Kiva Eger of our generation. And he studied because his father then went for a brief period of time to Paris to become a rabbi. Re- Rav Herzog studied at the Sorbonne, where he got his master's. He then got his doctorate at the University of London, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. A very important thing. In 1916, he became the Rav, the chief rabbi of Belfast. Belfast is in Ireland. Rav Herzog spoke 12 languages fluently. 12 languages. And he spoke English with an Irish accent. In 1917, he married a woman by the name of Sarah Heilman. Her father was a dying in London. Apparently the story goes that he went to a rabbinic conference as you know, as is the case in many places, they had conferences of Rabbanim and this young Gon, this rabbinic genius shows up and who is there? The dying in London and who comes to serve tea? None other than his daughter, Sarala. And that was the Shidduch. Rav Herzog and the dying of London and he gets married in 1917. In 1922, he becomes the chief rabbi of Ireland, 
which was itself a fascinating. There's so many fascinating stories I can't even describe. He becomes the chief rabbi of Ireland until 1935, when he becomes the chief rabbi of Israel. Actually, before that, he had applied. He was running to be in the running to be the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. He was rejected in favor of anybody know who was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv who was chosen before of Herzog in 1935. Anybody know guesses? Got to unmute so I can hear you. I'll give you a hint. Rav Cook. Well, the Rav, Rav Cook, Cook was the chief. The right, yes, Rav Cook was the chief rabbi of Israel. Rav, before Rav Herzog was named as the Rav Cook's successor of the chief rabbi of Israel, Rav Herzog was applying to be the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, from which he was rejected. Okay. Anybody know? So I'll give you a hint. This chief rabbi of Tel Aviv is coming from Antwerp. He was the chief rabbi of Belgium. In 1935, Rav Amiel, Rav Amiel was chosen as the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. And not only was he beating out this young rabbi, Rav Yitzchak Isaac Alevi Herzog, he was also beating out another young rabbi from also from out of town, from not in Israel, who also had a doctorate. Anybody know who that was? I'll give you one hint. He would later end up in Boston. Rav Yosef Dov Halevi Soloveitchik. The Rav and Rav Herzog both lost out in their candidacy for the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv to Rav Amiel. But anyway, Rav Herzog settles in Israel with his family in 1935, and then he becomes unbelievably active in public life as not just the chief rabbi as a figurehead, but as someone who crisscrossed the world in the Olam Hamaisa, in the Olam Hamaisa. He was one of the people who saw the Holocaust and the impending destruction of worldwide, of rabbinic and lay and European Jewry. He saw it many, many years before anybody else. He crisscrossed the world. He spoke with dignitaries. He met with people in, in England. He met with FDR. He personally met with FDR and was very disappointed afterwards. During the war, he was active in trying to get visas in Hatzalah's unbelievable Misa that his sister was in, was in Paris before the Germans marched into Paris. And so they, someone sent word to him. And because he was the chief rabbi, people knew who he was. They asked him, one of, I think, his family members said, could you please intervene and put in a specific request? Because his sister was, of course, a British citizen to get her out of Paris. And he said he wouldn't do that. You know why? Because he had other major requests in with the British government to save many, many Jews with visas. And he didn't want to take a personal family favor that might jeopardize his other visa requests. He was an indefatigable activist for Hatzalah. And then, of course, unfortunately, it wasn't very successful in the most part. Most of European Jewry was, of course, destroyed. So Herzog then traveled to Europe across. Many of you remember, he traveled to the Pope. And he was, and this is what Shai Agnon, he was banging down doors of convents and monasteries to find Jewish children. There's, a, there's an apocryphal song of Shema Yisrael. Some of you are nodding on this. You remember this, like a song that, they, that story about singing Shema Yisrael outside of, of, of a Jewish, uh, of a non-Jewish home or outside of a monastery is Rav Herzog. And we'll come back to it a little later. Like you can't imagine. Then he comes back to Israel and he sets up, sets to work to make sure that the founding of the state of Israel to the extent possible would be Alpi Ruach HaTorah, according to the spirit and the, and the law of Halacha. Finally, he is elected to the chief rabbinate three times subsequently and passes away in 1959. I'm going to show you on the screen some amazing things today. Let me see if I can pull it up right now. Hold on. This is an article. This is a news clipping. Is it? This is it. So, so many of you are familiar today with the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. So this is a copy of the JTA bulletin. Can you see it on the screen? The JTA bulletin 
Monday, July 27th, 1959, 661st Avenue, New York. He describes how it describes here Rabbi Herzog passed away peacefully in his sleep. He had been ill for several months. His Levaya was attended by tens of thousands of people. And you see that the, the family did not allow, you see here on the, where he passed away on Shabbos, they did not, infor, they did not inform the public on by Israel radio at the request of the family, partly not to violate the Sabbath and partly not to impair the joy of the day of rest for Israel's Jewry. People flocked into the streets. You see how it describes there were thousands of people weeping openly in the streets at the passing of Rav Herzog. He was so beloved. He dies in 1959. So let's now, let's now look at the letter. So you have it in your email. I'll put up, pull it up also on the screen if you don't have it in front of you. Here we go. Today's letter. Yitzchak Isaac Alevi Herzog, Lemechubadai Hayakar Vahana Allah, to my honored and dear and exalted Mar David Ben Gurion Rosh Memshelis Israel. Dated Chaf Dalad Teves Tavshin Yutes, meaning only a few months before Rav Herzog passed away. Kvod Rosh Memshala, honored Prime Minister. And again, you have it in your email in the English if you want to follow in the English. Shura Hasheilos, the line of questions regarding Bedin Avlad Shinolad Menanachris, regarding a child that's born from a non Jewish woman, Shehufnu Leishim Shonim Higa'atani, that was passed over, that was handed to different people, meaning this is the letter that we're dealing with, that many people received this letter. It arrived. Hine, behold. Listen to how Rav Herzog answers this letter. Kvar Omar Bala Kuzari Zatzal. The author of the Kuzari, Rav Yehuda Halevi, his memory should be for a blessing. He said, Shahatora lo hinicha es mitzvoseha hefker. We need to know that the Torah did not leave its commandments hefker. Va'af gedolei Torah bale hora. And even those gedolei Torah, those Torah giants, those sages, who are the giants of hora of rulings? Ain sam chusam. They do not have the authority. Lekvias halacha, the authority of establishing halacha. Novas midatam midata heim. It doesn't just emerge from their minds. They just can't make it up as they see fit. If you're a posik, you can't just decide what you want. Ki midas Torah shehim morim. From the Torah that they are learning and teaching. And our sages taught us they protect us. The Torah is there to protect us, to Mahavim, and it exists as Makor Chiyusenu, the source of our life. The rabbis, says Rav Herzog, we don't have the authority to change the halacha. And not only that, the Torah and the halacha is there to protect us. It's the source of our life. Kiem chayenu. And this is what he writes now. Second paragraph. When the ultimate redemption comes. Yisrael. God says to the Jewish people. Bonai, my children, kinderlach. Ani tameamikem. I'm amazed at you. I'm wondering about you. How did you wait for me all of those years? Think about when Rav Herzog is writing, what his life was about, when he lived, what he experienced. Instead of quoting, and we'll see over the course of the year, different letters from different rabbis of different sources. What does he quote? He quotes this medrash about how HaKadosh Baruch Hu will come to us in the Kates when it's time for the Geula. Rav Herzog is writing in the context of the founding of the state of Israel, the beginning of the Gula. And he says, look how difficult our Gullus was. Imtantanli, Rav Herzog says. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us, God says to us, 
You waited for me. You didn't give up on me. You were here for me. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us. That's what he says to us. It's incredible. We, could you imagine in the year 2020, we're still learning Torah. We're still learning HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Torah. We waited for him. Kolos and Hashanah. The Heim Omri Bolofanov says the Medrash, they will answer, we will answer HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Ribona Shalolam. Ilule Torascha Shenasatalanu. Had it not been for the Torah that you gave us, Kvar Avadnu Ba'umos, we would have been lost among the nations. We would have assimilated. You know what keeps us alive, says Rav Herzog, today? It's Dafka the Torah. Otherwise, we would be lost. We would be assimilated and disappeared. Ikar kol atzmo shalayadus. The, the central focus, the main ikar, the essence of all of Judaism, who at Torah Shabbat is the Torah. Va'ata now, kone ani el kvodo, I turn to you. Shebeshem, shekeshem shehodia, just like he said, he informed, al hashbosas hanchayos, hanchayos bedavarishum b'nei nochrios, shem nogdim nigud gomel adin torasenu, that you, Prime Minister Ben-Gurion, have stopped, have ceased, as you remember. This letter was sent in December of 1958, based on the Knesset finding that they decided in the summertime that they were not going to continue with the registration of March 1958, when they said that you could register your kids however you want. Rav Herzog says to Rav Ben-Gurion, you have stopped. You said we're not going to. No gate ni good gomel adit torasenu. We're not going to have that. Parenthetically, there's a famous quote that Rav Herzog was very upset when Ben Gurion was asked, "Well, what happens when you have a clash between Torah and state?" And Ben Gurion said, "The state will triumph." Rav Herzog said, "Absolutely not." Sheyakom, he says, "I'm asking that you, Ben Gurion, get up kaes veyodia bitul and amuchlat, the absolute negation." Of all of those statements that are against the Torah. Here, Rav Herzog, as his in his role as the chief rabbi, advocating for legislation that supports Torah. And that will save the people in the land of Israel and in the diaspora me from terrible. Nisiduras hapilug from the from the disenfranchisement from the from the fractiousness v'tishtu sefer yuchsin and for the litashtesh means to mess up the lineage asher biladecha yisarer hayisod that without your action to safeguard this yisarer it will be crumbled hayisod the foundation asher kol binyan base yisrael omidalov that the entire house of Israel stands on it. Rav Herzog, as the first chief rabbi during the founding of Hakamas Medina, was one of the few, one of the critical, crucial individuals who was instrumental in ensuring that personal status issues, issues of gior and marriage, were under the domain of the Rabbanu Tarashit. And now he says to Rav Herzog, we will destroy everything if you allow people to be registered as Jews who are not Jews. And in the merit of memory of, in the merit of this, we will have peace internally outside. And to the Redeemer, Yisrael Yishkon Shanan Uboteach Al Adma Savusov, Amen Vaame the Virka Satora Vitzion, Mechabdo, those that who honors you, Ben Gurion, Umo Kiro Kurum Eriko, and appreciates you for that which your tremendously valued Yitzchak Isaac Alevi Herzog. Rav Herzog says to Ben Gurion, please, please, we must ensure the halachic character and the stability and the living of the Torah exactly the way that it has been done for generations, because that stood with us. That's what ultimately is the Kiyom of Am Yisrael. So this is the letter. But you see how Rav Herzog is framing this letter and emphasizing it in the context of history 
and in the context of the practicality of what it will do to the Jewish people. Rav Herzog understood the centrality of Torah. He invokes Dafka that it is, it is our people, Kiem Chayenu, but then it's going to be practical. And this gets back to where we started, Rav Herzog, as the person of Torah Lamaisa. Torah Lamaisa. Rav Herzog, he, be, he, let's, you know, I think there's so many. He models for us this idea of taking Torah and applying it in the real world, in the world of action, in Olam HaMaisa. So I want to give five examples of this. The kids are Nimrats because there's so much to say. I'm going to turn your attention now to the screen where you're going to see a, a piece of the website, a website called Psil Techeles. And the reason why this is interesting is because I mentioned earlier that Rav Herzog had a PhD. Well, what was his PhD in? His PhD, here you see a picture of Rav Herzog on, this, on the screen. And this is a section of the Psil Techeles website called the Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Herzog Techeles Reading Room. What was his PhD in? First of all, here is a fantastic picture of this Gon Adir when he got his PhD from the University of London in Hebrew porphyrology. Okay, I don't know what porphyrology is. At least I can pronounce it. Porphyrology, of course, though, is the study of the ancient biblical dye, Tcheles. So here's Rav Herzog, and this is the actual picture. They have it on the website here of Rav Herzog's doctorate. Anybody wants to read it, you can download the entire thing. It's only 200 and, I think it's 246 pages of chemical and historical research. It's coming up on the screen now. All right, we don't have to see the whole thing, that's okay. No, but it's coming. This is the entire doctorate, you can download it. Semitic porphyrology. Rabbi Dr. Isaac Halevi Herzog, did it, did it come up? Let me see if it came up, the whole thing. No, it's still loading. You see also on this website, uh, his Tcheles correspondence, because what is porphyrology? What is Rav Herzog trying to figure out? Because in the 19th century, there was a, a great Hasidic master known as the Rabzina Rebbe, and the Rabzina Rebbe suggested a, a possibility, which is, I believe, the still way, the way that the Rabzina Hasidim wear Tcheles today, I think it was from a, either a cuttlefish or from a, um, from a um, squid. And Rav Herzog analyzed this. Is it on the screen now? You see it? Thumbs up. Can you see the screen? Rav Herzog's, uh, yeah, you see it now. Semitic porphyrology, Tcheles. <clears throat> Rabbi Dr. Isaac Alevi Herzog, doctor of literature from the University of London. He writes, yeah, someone direct message, why do they have the same name, Yitzchak and Isaac? This is not uncommon in uh, Europe that in Yiddish, people had multiple names that meant the same thing. So for example, you'll find in Yiddish, Yiddishized names like Zev Wolf, Dove Bear. People know this. It's not so common today to name kids like that, but in Europe, it was very, very common. So they called him, his name was Yitzchak Isaac. Not uncommon to Dove Bear. Okay, here it is. Why does it say Paris on there? Because when did Rav Herzog start working on this? When he was in the Sorbonne. He only published it as his doctorate later. Chapter one, purple dying in antiquity. So what is Rav Herzog teaching us? This is case, case study number one, Torah Lamaisa. We need to use chemistry to figure out what was Tcheles. So he does all kinds of experiments and he ends up with a snail, a snail called the Murex trunculus. The problem is that when Rav Herzog experiments with it, because it's not just theoretical Torah, it's Torah Lamaisa. So you have to do experiments. You have to figure out what is the Tcheles. The problem is he kept getting a purple dye. So he ultimately says, maybe this is not it. And he moves on to something else. You see the uh, origins of the dye. He gives you the whole history here. Chilazon. This is Gemara in different places. Ultimately, he le leaves it with the Helix Jan Janitha, but initially he tried it with the Murex trunculus. What happens later in the, uh, and this is what the Psiltcheles guys have now, and if you see on my tzitzis here, 
Oh, by the way, this is a proof that even when speaking on Zoom, one needs to wear pants. Here is the trellis, if you can see it, this is the blue dye, right? This blue dye comes from the murex trunculus that Rav Herzog figured out, but the, the chap was that when, when you take this dye and you leave it out in the sun, that's how it went from purple to blue. So that's how the modern day psil trellis guys make trellis, they leave it outside and it turns blue, amazing. And there's so much more to say. There's tons of books. I have an entire safer on this. I have actually three, three volumes. Here are two of them. These are two volumes called Misha Yakir, which was which is a collection, two volumes of Misha Yakir, two, two volumes on the concept of Trelas. And then here, here are some English pamphlets. If anybody's interested, I can lend them to you on uh, Trelas Bismana Zeh. There's a lot, there's so much more to say, but this is a beautiful little packet if anybody wants in English, you can get a lot of the stuff on their website. Trelas Bismana Zeh. Who was the, the one who figured it out? Oh, I see someone's putting it on their screen. Who figured this all out? Rav Herzog, because it was Torah Lamaisa. It was using his knowledge of chemistry and historical research and all kinds of documents to figure it out. That's example number one. Number two, law. I have here two volumes called The Main Institutions of Jewish Law. It's an incredible work because Rav Herzog took the concepts of Chosh and Mishpat and puts them into English. How do you explain what is a Kenyan, right? Dafyomi folks, some of you remember from Seder Nazikin, what is a Kenyan? An acquisition. How do you describe that in halacha? So I'll I'll share them with you. Uh, which shelf are they on? I don't see them at the moment. They're probably on the other shelf. The main institutions of Jewish law. Two volume set that Rav Herzog wrote to explain how halacha in in Choshen Mishpat is to be understood in modern legal terms. And so one of the main focus. Uh, foci of Rav Herzog's work in the, in the 1940s was to synthesize and bring halacha and Choshen Mishpat into Israeli law, which of course was based on British law and Turkish law, common law it's called. So Rav Herzog, in one of his farm called Tchukal Yisrael Pia Torah, he describes how in his opinion, he thinks it's a shanda that the Jewish state should be following some secular form of law. Oh, well, I have a, a shout out here from Mrs. Greenfield. One of the Cy Greenfield Memorial Lectures was all about Trelas. Yes, that's right. That was, I think it was Ari Greenspan who gave that lecture. That's exactly it. Yes. So this second point is about law, what we call Mishpat Ivri. How do we have Israeli law? So Rav Herzog quotes, he quotes here from the Chuvas Harash Bats, that those who go outside of Torah to Erkos, to non-Jewish, even, he says, even shall a Muslim, it's, as, it's, a, it's a disgrace. He says, even though Muslims are for sure, they are not idol worshippers, Muslims, but by going to them, you are Harihu Nechshav Lemeyaker Torosmu Vavatal Toros Moshe. It's like a person is validating and valuing other, other systems of law, and you're shaming our tradition, our Torah Moshe. And that's how Chazal says it's like meyaker elilim. It's almost like validating idols. Ani Omer meata, ani Omer. Sha'am Yisrael, the Jewish people, ube Eretz Kacho, it's a holy land. La'achar shen zacha shuv l'malchus. Rav Herzog celebrated Medinas Yisrael. He celebrated the founding of the state. Kishu ozi v'storos enu akdosha. When we abandon our Torah and instead we use other systems of law, foreign law, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not saying that it is it says it doesn't have a religious character, it's totally secular. who It is like kicking the our Torah. So Rav Herzog was pleading and cajoling and pushing that the Israeli law, that Mishpat Ivri, be done al Torah. And even though he was only partially successful, you can argue how successful, how not successful, he generated an entire movement 
of people, of scholars, of law experts who are engaged even today in this realm of Mishpat Ifri. We had a Kolo fellow here who was a student of a major legal scholar in Israel as a professor. His name is Aviara Cohen. Aviara Cohen, some of you may have heard of him. He was a, a, a Yeshiva Taretzion um, Talmud Chacham. He's a tremendous law professor. He's an expert. He's dealing with Mishpat Ivri. These questions of law, religion, from a, from a uh, halachic standpoint, and law. How did this start? Who got this going? For many of you, for not familiar with the famous judge, Menachem Elon. This whole world of Mishpat Ivri, of insisting that our Torah has something to say about legal application, legal theory, and legal practice. Lamaisa today, in the 2020 era, Rav Herzog said that. Rav Herzog said that about the code of law in the modern state of Israel. Third area, agriculture. Some of you know this book that I mentioned before called Masu'a L'Yitzchak. Masu'a L'Yitzchak is a play on words off of a kibbutz, Masu'ot Yitzchak. Masu'ot Yitzchak. So I want to show you an article on the screen. You ready for this? This is a it. One second, take a look at this. I don't know where is it. Oh, I don't see it now. There is an article. Hmm. I'm not seeing it right now. I thought I had it online. Maybe I put it in the email. There is an article. Oh, maybe here. Hold on. That of the of the founding. Oh, where is it? Now I can't see it. I must have closed it. Masuod Yitzchak was a kibbutz, a religious kibbutz that was founded in Gush Etzion in 1945. And then, of course, unfortunately, with the fall of Gush Etzion and the War of Independence, it was destroyed. That was reconstituted later. Uh, it's actually, a, it's still a kibbutz today. It's part of the, of the, of the religious kibbutzim network. Anybody know where Masuod Yitzchak is today? Anybody know? By Tirat Svi. It's, it's not Tzvi. far from Ashkelon and Ashdod. Oh. Not far from Ashkelon and Ashdod. And um, it was called Masuot Yitzchak in honor of, during his lifetime, in honor of Rav Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Herzog, because it was a group of religious pioneers. And so there was, a, I could get you the article. There was a whole article in the newspaper that you can download from, oh, ah, yes, I got it. One second. I know where I'll find it. It's right here. Take a look at this. Uh, I don't want to disappoint you. Here it is. It's a good thing you came this morning. You got to see this. Here we go. This is, many of you remember this newspaper, Hatzofer? You remember this newspaper, Hatzofer? Thumbs up, yes? You see it on the screen? Yes, so, so this was the religious Zionist newspaper for many, many decades. Take a look, when you go down to the next, here we go. Masuo Yitzchak al Shem Rabbah HaRashi Shal Eretz Yisrael. This newspaper is from Tel Aviv Daily. Yom Chamishi Chav Hei Cheshvan Tov Shin Vav, Thursday, the 1st of November, 1945. And this is announcing in the news that Masuot Yitzchak in Kfar Etzion is right near Kfar Etzion is being renamed in honor of Rav Herzog. And they go through the newspaper here, which you can take a look at. I can give it to you. Here it is, Rav, Rav Rashi. He gave a speech there. They describe how they had a special uh, fabrengen in honor of this. That's actually the newspaper. If you would open the newspaper that day in Hatzofe, you would see you have Masuo Yitzchak. Rav Herzog was so devoted to the land of Israel, and he was de devoted to the farmers of Israel. And one of his uh, sons in the back, they tell little Misa that for many years, Rav Herzog said, you know, the truth is all I would like to do. He was such a goan adi, he was such a big activist. He said, you know, maybe I would just like I'll go live in Israel. I'll live on a farm, on a moshav, and I'll be a farmer. That's what Rav Herzog said before he went to Israel. I mean, he was younger, living in Ireland. He said, ah, oh, I'll just live. You know, he didn't have to meet with statesmen. He wasn't going to change the world. He would just live as a farmer. And we once mentioned years ago, a tshuva that appears in the Heichal Yitzchak. Rav, Rav Herzog's tshuvas, they are collected, many of them, in a, in a five-volume set called Heichal Yitzchak. And he writes a tshuva 
to one of the kibbutzim about Shilas regarding Orla. And of course, he was a bucking Kol Tarakula. So these new questions in the state of Israel, which had never been asked in Poland, because the mitzvah Satchluyos Baaretz didn't apply there, now they're no geya. Now they're applicable. So Rav Kook, uh, so Rav Herzog is now telling us that this, this is experienced Lemaisa. This is what everybody is going through. It's Torah Lemaisa of how to build the state of Israel. That's number three, agriculture. Rav Herzog living in the land of Israel. Number four is, of course, Rav Herzog's active involvement in Hatzalah, his involvement in the DP camps. Some of you remember, I think it was a couple of years ago, I'm trying to remember when it was, that, um, that Rabbi Beryl Wein came to Chicago and he spoke, he spoke in Ortora a few years ago. And he told an unbelievable Misa. He told a Misa about Rav Herzog from his youth. He said he remembers, <coughs> I forget whether he said he was on the west side of Chicago. I think he said the Skogi Yeshiva at that time, Hebrew Theological College, Bishmer Shlator was on the west side of Chicago. And I think he said, I forget exactly how old he was. He said, I think he said it was 1949 or 46, something like that, late 1940s. Rav Herzog came to Chicago. He said he remembers going with his father in the car to the airport. He said, in those days you went to the airport, I think it was Midway. He said, you drove right up to the landing strip. He said, Rav Herzog got out of the plane with his top hat, tall, regal, full beard. He said, he looked majestic. And he said, the, the Balabatim and the few, uh, his father was the Rav, they drove from the airport, from Midway to the west side of Chicago to a packed auditorium of, of boys and Balabatim to hear Rav Herzog here live in Chicago. And he said he remembers as a boy what Rav Herzog told him. He said he got up at the lectern, he looked at all the boys, and he said, you are the Jewish children, you're the future of these people, of our people. And then he said that Rav Herzog, a grown man in a beard and top hat, started to cry. He started bawling with his hands covering his face and and Beryl Wine, he said he was a, he, a young boy. He said he never saw a grown man cry, let alone a man who was the chief rabbi of Israel, speaking in perfect English with a top hat, with a command of Kola Torah Kula, was crying. Because Rav Herzog said to them, I was in Europe. I met the Pope and I tried to save Jewish children, but I couldn't. I tried to save whatever was left of the future of the Jewish people, and I only saved a few children. There are so many children who are gone. They were murdered or they're lost and they're in Christian homes or they're in monasteries. And, and Beryl Wine said, he looked at us and he said, you children, you are the ones who are going to be the future of the Jewish people. You need to take the place of these lost children. Beryl Wine said it left such an indelible impression on him. He remembers it decades later. Could you imagine what that must have been like? He spent months after the war traveling through Europe. In the Sefer here, it gives a, a speech that he gave that he wrote down on Shavuos. On Shavuos, this was May of 1946. Where is Rav Herzog in May 1946 on Shavuos? He's in Forenwald, a DP camp. Famous DP camp, because you know what's in this DP camp? The Kloisenberger <clears throat> was in this DP camp. What do you say on Hallel? How do you sing Hallel? What does that even mean for people whose literally their lives were destroyed? They were totally broken. Rav Herzog got up and he spoke in Forenwald, which is a, a camp, a DP camp, not far from Munich. It existed there, by the way, under the American auspices until 1957. Rav Herzog says in Shacharis, we said hollow. We said hollow. We just, many of us just said hollow a few minutes ago in Shul. But he's talking in foreign world. He quotes in the Apostle, You've saved my soul from death. <laughs> from 
He says, this captures your experience. You, the survivors in foreign world, in these psukim, your prayers are captured to go when you merit the meher of Yamenu to go to the land of Israel. And then you can all say, thank you, God, who kills, who's mamus, who machai, who lives, that you saved my life, you can say, from those wicked, cursed, who destroyed, who came to destroy. And even though I, afal pisha ani nisharti b'chayim, even though I'm still alive, my eyes, you the survivor, says Rav Herzog, and by the way, he has another, he gave another similar speech, understanding the experience that these people had. He said, your eyes have seen what you have seen. And from what you, the destruction that you saw, there is no ceasing of crying, of tears from your eyes. It's always this any mindima. And after the death camps were destroyed, then you have been wandering. You've been wandering from DP camp to DP camp. All these different places, from, from place to place. Katsti Bakayai, many of you feel like you don't want to live. How can you live? Esragli Midechi, to be crushed. My feet, you say, your feet are so tired of wandering around. But where do we want to help you, to settle you, that you can end up? You're not going to end up in some foreign land. And to be a citizen of that land, it's not worth anything. That's not real life. After you have gone through all 77 levels of Gehenim of the Nazis, that most, the Ruba, the Ruba of our, my brothers and sisters and my homeland, all my family is destroyed. One place, Rak Zion, only Israel will fill some level on the Halala Ayom. That's the only place where I can live from now. That, that's the only place, as Rav Herzog, that a person can feel that can heal their soul that's crushed and broken and to strengthen their, their emuna, which is shaking. Only in Israel can you feel like you're at home. When a person is still feeling, he says, we're in Fornwall, they still feel the sword of the wicked, Yamach <coughs> Shemam, still hanging over their neck. Can a person in south of Munich still believe that they will make it to Israel, that they will ultimately see these psukim, see these psukim realize, I've been so tortured. But when I've been grasped by despair, everyone has disappointed me. Humanity has let me down. And yet, Baruch Hashem, Baruch HaLokeit Sion, Shezachisi Lahodos Lashem. I can thank God even in this circumstance. Shal Tikvas Eisan with the hope, Shal Am Yisrael of the Jewish people, Ham Yuad Lios Lebrach HaLchol Anosh Kula. That will ultimately be the blessing of the entire humanity. This is where Rav Herzog said on Shavuos. And finally, one last Ha'ara. One last place in which Rav Herzog was Lamaisa, and there are so many more. So we said Rav Herzog was Lamaisa in the world of science, in mitzvahs and tcheles. He was Lamaisa in the world of law and mishpat ivri. Lamaisa in the world of agriculture, and mitzvah tzluyas ba'aretz, and wanting to settle the land. Lamaisa in the world of chesed, of hatzala, of hatzalas klal yisrael, of activism. And then Lamaisa in the world of tefillah. In what area of tefillah? So many of you are familiar with this. Rav Herzog was the author of what we call the Tefillah L'Shlom Amadina, the founding of the, of the prayer of the State of Israel. So it wasn't just that Rav Herzog was uh, someone who believed in the State of Israel. He was active. I'm going to share the screen of this interesting article that I shared in the email this morning. Here it is. Can you see it on the screen? Yes, okay. This is gonna be the famous envelope. This is the Tefillah Shlomo Medina that we say that Rav Herzog penned 
This is the beginning of the Smichas Gula. Who did he write the tefillah with? Who did he give to edit the tefillah of Shlomo Medina? He gave it to his friend, the man that we opened this year with, his colleague, his friend, his chaver, the poet laureate, the Nobel winner, Shai Agnon, who gave that beautiful hesped for him, which is published in the end of Masu'a Yitzchak. Rav Herzog wrote it. There was some controversy about this. There's Shai Agnon on the screen. Here comes the famous letter and the famous envelope. This is the Tefillah of the Shlom Medina that was published in Hatzofeh in November of 1948. The, exactly what we say today. This is the handwritten copy. Now, this is the handwritten copy from Shai Agnon. So there was some con- contention in the early 80s that maybe Shai Agnon wrote it, but here is the original text with the envelope. This is the famous envelope. Tefillah Hamedina Kefi she hitikua vitikna mar agnon b'ksav yad. This envelope contains the ksav yad of Shai Agnon, who copied and added, he added five words <coughs> to the Tfilah Shoma Medina that Rav Herzog had written. So it was Rav Herzog who wrote the Tfilah Shoma Medina, sent it to Shai Agnon to look it over. Shai Agnon gave it his imprimatur. He wrote five words, he wrote it over in his hand and sent it back. So Rav Herzog is the author of the Tefillah of the Shlomo Medina because for Rav Herzog, he also, by the way, when he was standing in the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto, also wrote a kina over this because Rav Herzog is Torah Lemaisa. It's not enough to believe that Israel, the state of Israel, is is part of our religious life. It's not just enough to believe that Api Ashkafa Satora, it has to be Torah Lemaisa. So he said there has to be a tefillah. You have to action. You have to make it into the world of action. So what did Shai Agnon, the co-author or the, the person who, who added his stamp onto the tefillah of Shlomo Medina, what did he say about Rav Herzog? He said he was gedolim b'koim b'koach ha-Torah and yesh gedolim b'koach ma'aseyim. Rav Herzog was both. And that is the context of this letter that Rav Herzog wrote to Ben-Gurion, that we need to ensure that we have a Jewish state because the Torah is not just a theory, it is a practice. And that's how we're going to live. And that's the vision that we have for our state. Thank you all for joining. Have a great day. Chanukah Sameach. Stay well. See you in Mirza.